Yeah, just a couple uh, quick announcements for the board to think over before I do this by email. But I, Ann Watson called me today. Apparently, on the 18th, uh, the EIC is presenting some results from the net zero uh, to the city council. That's also, I think, our board meeting. So if board members want to attend that, we might want to think about either doing a joint meeting or rescheduling ours for the next week. So we can work that out by email when it's done already. Uh, I talked to Carol from uh, Restorative Justice, and we were playing phone tag, but she has some proposals and some questions that she needs to keep with her back on that. Uh, and then I touched bases briefly with Nathan uh, about coming back, and we might want to plan for that later. Um, but again, I'll, I'll follow up on that talk more. Um, so public comment. Uh, we have a fair amount of folks, so if anybody wants to, um, to give public comment, we Do we want to speak to each other about that? Yeah, no, we definitely could. Um, let's start with Jared. Jerry Hess, local to the board member, and we're from you. Um, <laughs> not much else to say. I'm Jill Ravick. I'm a elected to board member. Speak up, man. Sure thing. I live in Montpelier and I have a daughter at the middle school. I'm Kristen Gettler. I am a school board member for MRPS, the Bell and Brock Service Center. Yeah, and I'm Jim Murphy. I'm also uh, a Montpelier resident and board member. And I have uh, a stepson and a son about to go to MHS and a daughter in middle school. I'm Emma Bay Hansen, and um, I was actually born in East Roxbury, so I have my roots here, and then raised in Montpelier, and I'm still on the board, and I have two kids in the district. Hey, I'm Amanda Garcet, and I am a Montpelier resident, and I have two kids in the district. Yes, I am. My turn. Yeah, can you, can, you, well. can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Mia Moore. I am a Montpelier resident and a member of the school board. I have three kiddos in the district as well. Um, so hearing no public comment, it looks like we don't have anyone. Okay, great. Uh, let's move to the consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Um, I'll make a motion to approve, uh, but I'd like to pull the superintendent report, the facilities committee notes, and the August 4th draft agenda, just with some, uh, with what I think will be very quick questions. Okay, so the superintendent's report, and what else do you want to pull? The facilities committee notes okay. and the um, August 4th draft agenda. Okay. Right, so do I have a second to approve the consent agenda with those three things pulled? I second. Great. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Consent agenda passes. Um, and go ahead, Mia, uh, with those three items. Great. Thanks. Uh, so first on the superintendent report, I wanted to say thanks Libby for sharing that process, like laying out the process for us that you're holding as you work through the proposal for the ESSER three funds. And then on the, you mentioned that there will be a board vote. Um, is that an up or down vote or will there be a way for the board to provide more nuanced feedback on the plan or proposed plan? 
Yeah, so we have scheduled in the, if you would click on the, um, <coughs> the yearly plan document, you can see in August, we'll have a board presentation around the SR3, concluding what kind of feedback we got from the survey. And so you'll have a chance to ask questions and have discussion then, and then it will be on the dashboard. <coughs> Will we will we also vote? I, that actually is the August fourth question I have. Will we also vote on the fourth, or do we vote on later than that? We'll vote on. I think we have a plan that we'll vote on the fourth. Okay. Um, for the facilities committee minutes, um, one thank you. I know Andrew Larosa isn't here, but I just wanted to say really great notes. That was super duper helpful. Um, and uh, it. I understand how the committee, one of the, the things in the notes that you named is that it's not a decision-making committee, which makes a lot of sense to me. I'm curious if you're thinking about it as a um, recommendation to, like, would there be recommendations to the board where the board makes decisions or is it really, would that, would those recommendations not come out of the committee? So I guess that's for any member of the committee who's in the meeting tonight. To introduce myself for the record anymore, like no. okay. no. <laughs> we will have nameplates. Yeah, we have nameplates. We do not currently. Yeah, that was one of the things we talked about. Um, well, basically, we want to sort of beef up some of the knowledge on the board about the facilities and really get to know them better. Um, one of the pieces that came out of it is we want to make sure that Andrew hosts tours of each of the buildings and that we would sort of help facilitate that. Um, and then things like the net zero piece that one of us would probably listen in on that conversation as well, so that we can then report back to the board on, on that piece. So I think it's more of a building a knowledge base. And then when, if and when there are things that need a deeper dive, this would be the place to put it. If there's a student proposal about a facility item, this committee could hear it first and bring it back to the board. So I think it's more, it's like a channel of, you know, building up that knowledge base and giving it to the board. I don't think it would get that much farther into major policy decisions. That would be for the larger board to discuss. I think I have that right to you. Great, um, thanks, Jill. And um, the last thing for on the August 4th draft agenda actually was really just a thank you and really appreciate seeing the draft schedule of meeting topics. It's it's very helpful to be able to see like the, in the, the full context, um, see each meeting in the full context of the year. So that's it for me. Um, sh should I make a motion to approve those three items then? I do have a question regarding the SR2 funding, yep. SR3. So when, um, how, what, how much are we taking into the feedback? The feedback from the community is like a mayor or EA on the plan that they're looking at. Like there's no, is there a way for community to say this is like some other needs that are needed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, on the that survey, the last survey, survey question. Mm -hmm. Um, it said something like, what other things would you like to consider um, as we go forward with this funding? funding? The survey has already gone out or is something that's coming? It came out today. Me again? Yeah. Um, go ahead and move, move that motion forward. Sure. So I'll I'll move to approve the superintendent report, the facilities committee minutes, and the August fourth uh, draft agenda. Great. Thank you. And uh, do you have a second? Second. Thanks. Uh, any discussion? Uh, those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Thanks. And. Um, Anyone have any objections to just adding a quick public comment after the evening presentation? Because my guess is that's probably why a number of people are here. So that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah, right. Right. Perfect. Yeah. So we'll give kind of five to ten minutes to make that. Um, great committee updates. I don't know. Building on the facilities committee. Sure. Anyone else? 
Um, I can just expand a little bit. Um, one of the, Andrew LaRosa is the facilities director for our district and he, um, he is going to be, it actually has, has already presented to the board and the public in the past and he's going to make it a regular piece, sort of a punch list of all the different items that are needing to be addressed in the various facilities and also the pieces that have been, um, you know, amended and fixed and addressed. There's a lot of um, age in a lot of our buildings that need some attention. And so it's helpful context for us as a community, as a board, to sort of know as we start to sort of move towards other directions of what we might want to focus on or where we might want to spend money, that we have that context of things that might not seem particularly exciting, but they need attention like heating and windows and, and painting and, um, you know, mitigating health issues in buildings, that those things are really important. So he's actually going to be making sure that each fall as a community, we have a really holistic picture of each and every building and ground need so that when we do have to make tough choices, we've got some priority and we're making an informed decision rather than just sort of taking what, what comes across on the fly. Um, so I'm really excited. I think we're going to try to have the tours um, adjacent to a board meeting. So for example, next time we're in this building, then we would have a tour either immediately before or immediately after that board members and the public could take to just really get to know the buildings a lot better. So we have some context when we're talking about that stuff. So um, yeah, and then as I mentioned before, just having sort of a conduit for the board when students might have a particular thing like the track that came up recently, or if there's something from that net zero result that the board needs to consider that we'll sort of be following that conversation. Um, questions for Bill? Well, Andrew, Andrew, Andrew would not. Yeah. Andrew. Not an official tour. Not, <laughs> not, not an Andrew LaRosa tour. That's a very different tour than the other. I think there are five times Andrew LaRosa tour. Yeah. 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 yeah, that would be great. That's awesome. Okay, I think just one thing to keep in mind with funding, or there's definitely restrictions on special funding. Um, I think it's just give us something to think about. That's just the vast area of community capital budget that we're going to Um, superintendent evaluation, I'm happy to do it, Jerry. Oh, yeah, do it. Um, so, uh, Olivia and I have, have gone over her evaluation at had some back and forth. I think the biggest next step is that we want some clarification on just a couple of things to make sure that there are clear objectives and goals and benchmarks. And we are starting to post circle on that. In summer <laughs> vacation, we have to <laughs> Anything to add? So what are the next steps? Do we need to move with Lydia as a committee? to go through that or um, I think we can do it either way. I think probably the best way is to get some of it in writing and then we okay. can probably pass it on and then maybe you and I can talk about whether we so we take the full committee and talk it out or um, or whether we can just like be separate as a committee and get back to her. I think um, maybe we'll have a committee meeting and document, and then check out. Okay, perfect. Okay. I mean, the committee will probably need to go over some of the feedback. Yeah. So, exactly. yeah. Okay. Any would questions? It, would it be helpful to have any other input from other board members or? I think it definitely would be, be helpful. Um, let us see what we put together and cut a file, like one of us part to present what we do. Um, but yeah. Any, any other questions on it? I think I just didn't catch the uh, Jerry. Did you say you're, you'll take point on setting up? Uh, eval committee meeting or would you like me to do that um i can do it if you want up to you. okay great thank you 
And Mia, can you hear okay? Um, some, like sometimes like the ends of words or the ends of sentences are getting a little bit swallowed, I think, but mostly yes. And where, Thanks for checking. Where are you getting your audio from, your computer? Or? Yeah, yes, it's coming from my computer. Like it's in my ears, but yeah. Your voices are going to the owl in the middle. Okay. Oh, she's um, okay. Good to know. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, all right, so what's your name? Everybody's got a presentation. Mm -hmm. Set it up. Yes. Um, yeah, so we've actually been talking about this for a while, various uh, visioning about how best to use our resources. I think the presentation will say we've got, you know, at least one building that is about to bust the seams um, and some other buildings with capacity. Um, and we really want to make sure that we have a robust to community discussion about how best to use the resources to, um, you know, serve both both communities and to serve obviously the students and the educational needs. So that way we can have, you know, excellent schools, um, both in Roxbury and Montpelier and kind of throughout. Um, and, you know, I think the, the goal for tonight is to get some background information and then decide on uh, a process to both come up with some of the questions I think we want to ask as a district and put a process in place to uh, get broad community involvement, broad stakeholder involvement, uh, and then move forward with some decisions to ensure that we've got, um, you know, long-term solutions that serve the best interests of both communities. And to add on, the purpose of tonight is to not get into trying to make decisions, <laughs> which is hard for us all to do, I think. Um, and then, so we'll do this presentation, which is relatively short, and then public comment, and then work discussion? Yeah. Okay, just want to make sure. Okay. Uh, so the question um, that we're putting towards the board right now is how do we best utilize the building resources of MRPS, so the physical buildings, to enrich the learning lives of our students. There's some merger information, just because I know that we have a relatively new board. Uh, this merger was completed in 2018, prior to my taking on a superintendent. So my first year as superintendent was the first year of the, of the merged school district. Um, and just I just took out the information in the merger agreement that pertains to the buildings. MRPS purchased all district property from the cities of Montpelier and Roxbury for $1. Now, Kristen, I know you checked in with Tammy Legacy, right. and she doesn't know what the record is. Neither Grant nor I were involved with that, so we have to do some digging okay. with yeah. some past. Okay. I, I don't know if Andrew wrote it, but Andrew started the same year I did. Right. So Institutional memory. Exactly. It's a little lacking <laughs> right now. So we just have to reach out to some former MR, MRPS employees and, okay. and see what we get. <laughs> and I just got the information today, so I didn't have time to do it today. Yeah. Um, the current school buildings will continue. It says in the merger agreement, this is the exact language from the agreement. Current school buildings will continue to function as education facilities through June 30th, 2022, unless the majority of the electorate of the municipality agrees with a plan to close a school facility within its border prior to June 30th, 2022. Okay, so that's the exact language from that's all there is really involving the physical building locations in that merger agreement. Actually, we have somebody who's on the, you might be able to talk to somebody. Have, two of them, all right. Two buddies. So maybe we need to pick your brains and talk about that $1 thing. Um, so that's all there is in the merger agreement uh, regarding the physical locations for the, or the physical locations of our school buildings. Current information, our enrollment right now, and this actually was updated yesterday with current enrollment information for RBS, um, because we've gotten some kids who have come back into the school after last year. And, and so the number that the board originally saw when this presentation was sent to you wasn't accurate. Uh, the approximate per pupil expenditure in FY21, which is this, the fiscal year we are in currently, was for Roxbury. Is $33,361 per pupil. 
the current enrollment coming into this current enrollment for school year 21 at the end of school year 21 was 28. Now coming into 2021 22 it's 37 so we're starting the year currently at 37 students here. Does that make sense. Yes. Okay. Um, so this year, this school year, we'll start this building at approximately 75% capacity um, because the building can hold approximately 50 students in the three classrooms. At UES, it's $21,891 per pupil. The current enrollment at UES is 383 students. That was at the end of 21. Um, so it could be a little bit larger because we had a year, much like in Roxbury, where kindergarten is a mandatory grade in Vermont. And so we, our kindergarten enrollment at UES is still pretty low compared to other years, but we may have a few more pupils there than, than what's listed there. But the last check we had was 383. Um, it can hold about 500 kids in that building. And so right now UES is about 77% occupied. MSMS price per pupil uh, for FY21 is 19,000. 824. The current enrollment, this is again at the end of 21, and I know we've had more enrollments since then, um, was 372. So we are actually up from that right now. Our 8th, 7th, and 8th grade in particular are bursting at the seams. Um, and it can hold approximately 375 kids. So we're pretty much at 100% capacity for Main Street Middle School at the moment. Um, and the, I should tell you the full capacity of students, we went back and forth as to how to, like we were gonna say like, how many kids can fit in the square footage of each classroom. We went down that road for a while. And then we just decided, we decided to look at the class size policy and say, what's the max amount of class of kids in a classroom that we say is, a, is an amount. And that's where we get these numbers. Okay, just so you know how, how we figured that out. Um, that's why there's an amount there. Uh, at MHS, at our high school, the cost per pupil is $23,019. At the end of 21, we had uh, 384 students there, and it can hold around 350 to 400 students. The reason why there's an around there with a dash is because high school is a different beast, and there's things like flexible enrollment, there's early college, kids are going to the tech center, like kids are in and out of that building. And they're not in one classroom all day long, or they're not in three or four classrooms all day long, they're in like eight, right? So it's just a different beast as to how many kids it can hold, um, which is why we have more of a range rather than a number for high school. And they're nearing 100% capacity. Um, finding space for district employees who need a place to hang their coat and you know, put a computer and have a phone is getting pretty hard to do in our district. At, there's no space at the middle school to do that. And typically a lot of people are housed at MHS um, and that is changing uh, pretty rapidly. So we've got some space issues going on at Main Street Middle School and Montpelier High School right now because we're robusting at the seams in a lot of, a lot of areas. Our staffing information, uh, when Jim and I were talking about this, he, he thought it would be really interesting just to get the teacher turnover rates. Um, so you can see the teacher turnover rates for both 2020 and 2001, keeping in mind that we're in a very odd time uh, we came off of a very odd year. <laughs> uh, so you can see the percentages there. Here at RVS, we had a 50% teacher turnover. And when it's teacher, it's professional licensed teacher. Okay, so it, this is not inclusive of instructional assistants or, or people of that nature. This is just professionally licensed teachers. Um, at UES, there was 6% turnover. At MSMS, there's 13%. And at MHS, it's 12% turnover for this coming school year. So we've got some new teachers coming in, which is exciting. General academic information. Um, I am presenting, I think if you saw the yearly plan, I'm presenting, Mike Berry and I will be presenting a more in-depth look at our SFAC scores, I believe in two board member meetings, three board meetings. Um, we just got that information, but it's on that yearly calendar there. So it's coming soon. This is not in-depth information about the SBAC. I will tell you there is an asterisk during the, for the 2021 um, scores. They may not be entirely accurate because not all kids took them. So the Agency of Education required that students take the SBAC in person. And we had, you know, 
we had about 70 kids who said, nope, not coming in a person who are part of our virtual school. So they were reported as zeros on our scores. Um, and there's no kind of ability measures for this, these scores for us back, but that's why there's a little, there's a little, um, we have to figure out how to use this data if, if, if we can at all, <laughs> and how do we present it to, to the public is definitely a question. But these are just the overall proficiencies so when it says district three, four, remember that's UES is three, four, because that's if there are only other grades three and four in the district. Um, so you can see it from 2018, 2019, students did not take the SBAC last year. So there is no scores available to us from last year. Um, and keep in mind that the 2018, 2019 third graders are, would have been fifth graders this past year. So they're going into their sixth grade year. So um, there's, there's, there are very different cohorts that you're seeing between 2018-19 and 2020-21. So it's just something to keep in mind, which is why we have to really think about how we present this information. Uh, but those are our, our scores here. And, and why did you say the scores were not available for RBS for those two? 20.1? Yeah, uh, and, but, but they are available for Montpelier District three four. Um, can you hold questions for public okay. comment? Yeah, I'll make a list. Yeah, no, please don't, no, please do, just so so we get the presentation of all. Yeah. Um. So decision points for the school board. That was just a very broad, quick data dump. Um. That we need lots more data, and that's that is very evident. That's just a very quick of where we are right now. Um, so the purpose of this particular conversation for the school board is to determine a process <laughs> for how to hold a larger community conversation regarding buildings. Uh, I think the school board uh, will need to have lots of conversations around determining how to enable broad-based community engagement on the topic. So should there be a board committee? What would be the charge? Do we need a professional facilitator for the process? And remind the board that in ESSER 2, we did put $40,000 out of ESSER 2 money to do that. So there is a good chunk of change available for the school district to hire a professional who really knows how to facilitate community engagement. Um, what is the time frame for the decision-making process? What would be the decisions, which is not on here? <laughs> um, and what questions does the board need to have answered right now? in this process, either in regards to data that I can provide or just more information. So really that's that's all that we had, I had planned for the board tonight, just in terms of information. The rest is just to, to start the discussion now. So, um, yeah, let's open it up for public comment. Let's give it 10 minutes and see how, see how we do. Um, so if you have some some questions and uh where's where's the best part to pick before the city and please announce your name before comment and, is it? and just speak toward the owl yeah, and speak toward the owl my name is Tom Fraser. I'm a resident here in Knoxville. I just had a couple of questions about the numbers. Um, you see that the current enrollment for 2021 is expected to be 37 or 28. Uh, that I, that's good news in terms of per pupil cost. Most in line with the elementary school. The other thing is, uh, what is your? Why do you think there's fifty percent teacher turnover? Why is the turnover rate so high in this school versus other schools? Is that um, due to the uh, management? For, I mean, you, you get a lot of comments. We own the greenhouse next door, so we get a lot of people. Uh, is it is it the management, or what, what's your reasoning for that? I mean, is that we're all that's falling for a laugh, I would say. <coughs> Tom, 
did you have another question? I'll take that one for right now. <laughs> okay. Um, I think there's probably, I don't want to make assumptions of staffing turnover um, because, because I'm not making that decision. However, I can say from, I know in year 2020, when there was 38% staff turnover, that two professionals transferred to Union Elementary. So we had a contract that um, any professional staff member, when there was an opening, professional staff members in our district have first dibs if they are licensed to be that, to hold that position. And so we had two teachers who, who worked here, who went to Union Elementary, or one, actually one went to middle school and one went to Union to teach there. Now actually, our middle school teachers coming back <laughs> um, to Lori Lyon Duke is coming back to the Roxbury to teach the three, four class. Um, however, that still equates to teacher turnover. I mean, because it's not a continuous line. Uh, so that's the reason why I know the 2020 turnover. In terms of the 2021, we're talking about a very low number of teachers here um, because we don't have many professional staff with nine uh, professional staff. Not all of them are full time. One retired, um, one decided to, to leave the field of education um, and go into more environmental issues. One was on an emergency you know, it was she was hired in an emergency regard, um, and that term was up. So we had we had lots of um, different. This year just was not normal in that term. So that's the reason why we have a higher percentage this year. So you expect that to settle out? I don't know, honestly, um, because the. 2000, so my first year superintendent was 2018-2019, um, and we, we don't have the 1920 data on here, but we certainly had turnover then too, so I'm not sure. I don't know if we have enough years as a merged district to be able to see any kind of trend there. I also, I thought about that 50% number and was wondering, you know, it, 50% of the teachers represents how many teachers? There's nine. Okay, so I mean, it can be a matter of three or four teachers, yeah. which makes that percentage look really stark. It is stark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Three yeah. or four employees and three or four, five yeah. leave. Yeah, that's a big deal. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, there's lots of reasons, obviously. Is that any, anything else? Yeah, I had one other question about the um, why the information was not available for the, for the testing for the RPS when it was one of the testing. The testing information is available. It, there weren't any kids who were proficient. There weren't any kids who were proficient in the, in the out of the twenty eight. No, those are only third and fourth graders. Only third and fourth graders take us back in this building. Class size is pretty small. Class of, and that's a that represents a very small number of children. So. Well, maybe I'm not aligned here, but that that just seems to be. I mean, I don't know how many kids those are. I know there are a lot of kids in town that have a lot of problems. There are a lot of smart kids too. I don't see how that number could be zero. There again, that seems to me to go back to the staff. I believe there's a correlation there too. And you know, I think my my grandchildren are going to be coming to school next year. And it's going to put it in the 37 and up. This just really concerns me. I mean, I've been involved in this school for 50 years. People are really stark numbers. And you guys got a lot of work to do. It's not going to be closed in the school. I think. Yeah, well, that's, that's exactly why we're here. Uh, other comments or questions? 
I guess I'll start. <laughs> I'll break the ice. Come on. Uh, Kimmy Crochet. I have two kids in the district. I'm a Roxbury resident. Um, my youngest is going into second grade. My oldest will be going into sixth grade um, at Main Street. Um, I'm here to hear more information. What's the process? Are you guys thinking of turning this into a special ed building for the district? Like what? What is the overall goal? Because we all are here, we are all taxpayers. We all have some have young kids coming in, some have kids transferring out. I hear Tom's issues as well. I've been here since my kid was in kindergarten, and you know I've seen her class was the biggest class. They had ten kids. They migrated out, and then Gracie's class has what five, six, and they have to merge them. So I'll tell you, last year straight out sucked. That class was a disaster. And I'll say it to all of you. There was problems after problems after problems. When my kid comes and says that she's hiding under a desk because there are boys that are like pulling and just being rude, that is a problem. So I don't think it's a building issue. I think it's a staffing issue. And coming in and making sure that the kids behave, manners and behave, respectful. That is the problem in this building. That is the problem, I think, why staff lead. That is the problem of low-income families and some not having the behavior and respect that some of us others enforce. So my point is, what's going to happen with this building come next June? I think the goal of tonight is to put a process in place to ask and answer that question in addition to you know other questions and how that relates to okay so what is the process that's what we're going to figure out okay so when is that going to be figured out i think we're going to start having that discussion after public comment and try to put in place at least the first steps to get that process moving so by next meeting we'll see it on virtual of what that process is we certainly hope to get it moving as soon as possible I want to have tonight's discussion occur before I make promises about what the next meeting is going to look like. But it's, I'm, I'm curious to see what that outline is. If it, it's going to impact me, the rest of these people here, the taxpayers, like it ultimately comes down to me saying, is it worth staying in this district or going to a different district? And then your numbers are low again because that's two kids pulled out. So, and that's me, so what about all the other families? You know, we are trying our best to like make this work, but every year there is a problem. There's always a bus issue. There's always a staffing issue. There is just one thing after another. And I'm sorry to like, just get it all out to you guys, but I feel like we never start early. You guys are always like six steps behind the ball. Sorry, I've seen it two years in a row where the bus issue turns into a hot mess and I'm I'm just waiting for August what 25th to come around and to say, oh, bus isn't gonna be there. Just saying, I'll be done that's the awesome so far. No, yeah. Um I'm Matt Williams. I have three kids in the district. Um, and I'm curious whether or not it's possible to hear possibilities. There's a space issue in Montpelier. There's a cost per student issue here. There are other problems here. There are behavioral problems, there are performance problems, retention problems. I'm just, you know, I'm not pushing anything. I just, I'm curious whether or not any possibilities will be voiced at all this evening and whether or not a bunch of options will appear at any time in the next you know month or two months i have no idea how long a process like this would take because i have no idea what is being considered uh, which is probably not a good idea <laughs> uh, so that's that's is there is there any possibility that any possible possible solutions or not solutions, but options. Just potential options will be, you know, voiced this evening.
I think we probably won't get deeply into it, but I think in terms of some of the questions the board would want, I'm sure a quick examination of options and possibilities is going to be helpful. So just to set in context, this visioning process was going to happen before COVID. We were about to launch, I think, a, at least one survey did go out, and everything got canceled because obviously the pandemic. So part of the what we're deciding tonight is um, the community will be included in, in those possibilities. So when you say possibilities, we'll be taking feedback from community members about what, what the vision should be. So I just wanted to make that clear that hopefully you will all be involved and give your input into that. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. This, I mean, this is a process we, we wanted to start 15, 15 minutes ago. And that, you know, the pandemic, I think, is a good excuse, but you know, I, we, we apologize for the fact that it's, it's late because it's, it's a needed conversation. Sounds like the process is going to take place pretty quickly. It has to be done before everyone, right? Um, the, oh, it doesn't have to be done before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. June. That's just in the merger as to mm -hmm. when decisions can be made after that date, but it doesn't have to be done by that. So I just ask that the board sends out communications to the public well in advance of whatever the next step is. Tonight's a prime example. Two of us here in this room are notified today via Facebook post that this meeting is occurring. Um, so having a more advanced notice posted via email, I didn't receive an email on the meeting. Um, would be helpful to have community feedback because you're going to have a very small audience without that proactive communication on this, the process and scheduling. Um, I highly recommend the survey along somewhere along the way. Um, it'd be helpful if you engage the community to maybe have some input on what questions are asked in that survey. Um, you can see there's quite a bit of concern here amongst parents and some might not be comfortable to talk to me in a public setting, so it would be beneficial to have that feedback. I'm sorry, what was your name? I'm sorry, Melissa Nguyen, and I have um, and 73 year olds in Roxbury. Third grade. Third grade. Oh, sorry. Third grade. <laughs> <laughs> They're awful big. Yes, they are. I was just going to say third grade. Okay, third. So thank you. <laughs> um, I can say something quick. Um, Melissa Rudder. Um, I currently have a, a third grader, um, but I have a, a preschooler um, who's currently in the Northfield School District um, for preschool, but will be here next year for in two years. So it, my concern to me is seeing that date, that, that June 30th date and what me, it means for my kindergartner. I'm obviously concerned about the school, current school year and all the issues that can be brought up. Uh, my daughter was in that same classroom. I understand we do not have the same teacher. She will also be in Ms. Duke's class, so I have a little little less angst about the the teacher situation but last year was not fun at all period um and it wasn't COVID related it was purely the classroom environment um obviously we have the bus issue which we I hope will not be an issue this year um but the bigger question is the community I have a big concern if the decision is to ultimately if the determination is to close this school Sending my kindergartner on a bus at 10 or 7 in the morning to Montpelier every day just doesn't sit well with me. Um, obviously, it is what it is when they get to fifth grade, they're older, and it works better. But that's my biggest concern is the younger group, kindergarten, first grade, and what that means for them, because that's a long day. And we already have bus issues with just the little route it does. I can't imagine sending all those kids on that bus to Montpelier. So that's my is that one okay. other um, frustration or concern I have with the school um, today is the lack of special education services within this school building. Um, last year it was PCL partly because of COVID, but also because of limited staffing and no special educator that was able to be hired for the school year. Uh, this year, I'm understanding we hired a 0.5 preschool and a 0.5 uh, 
special educator. She has no certification in special ed. Um, and I've been told by the principal she has no background in special ed, but yet she was hired to fill that position. I have a child on an IEP, um, and I was told she's going to be shadowing a special educator in Roxbury or Montpelier, but that person won't be coming out here. So essentially, it leaves parents feeling like our kids are being used as beta testers <laughs> for this new hire that just came in with no special education background. Um, and if we're merged, it would make sense that someone would be coming from the Montpelier School District with a special education certification and providing services to our kids with an IEP. It's been a lot. So. Yeah, I just want to reiterate, I mean, the, the June 30th um, <coughs> date, the, the biggest significance of that is that the process for closure of any building would shift from a vote to the regular statutory process. The regular what? Statutory process. Meaning? I mean, I think the board would say. Huh? That's the state And the state board. Yeah. yeah. So I'm Tina Munsey. Nice and loud, Tina. Pardon? Nice and loud. Oh, I'm Tina Munsey. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm Tina <laughs> <laughs> Speak to me, right. And I'm the other side of this merger. I live in Montpelier. I used to be on the school board and I was part of the merger committee. And maybe more important, I was a principal of a small school. And I love small schools. Having said that, I am really concerned about these figures in that it costs $10,000 a student more each year to educate a student in Roxbury. And by the way, the scores aren't good. The what? The scores, scores aren't, good. aren't good. So the system, the way I'm looking at it is something about the system's not working. And I, I think what the board's trying to say is today they're trying to figure out a system to figure out what, what would work. And my concern, Jim's talked about it, but my concern is it's going to take time in order for the people of Roxbury to have a say, for the people of Montpelier to have a say. Um, your taxes have been going down. Mine, on the other hand, have been going up for this merger. So, when you think about that, people in Montpelier have an opinion on this too. So I'm sure the board would like to know actually from you, I'm speaking for you. So, you know, how it is we would get people from Roxbury to speak up. How, how would you get people? And I can say this because when I was on the board and we came to Roxbury, unless there was a big issue, nobody came. Now, to be fair, in Montpelier, unless there's a big issue, nobody comes. That's the way school boards work, right? But in this case, it's a big issue. It's a big issue for all of us. So I think collectively we need to figure out what's the way we get people's input. And you're asking for possibilities. Maybe you have some that they haven't thought of. So we need to think about what will we do in this situation? And Historically, you have a lot fewer kids in the building than you had before, right? And as a principal of a small school, I can say the smaller it gets, the harder it is to educate. And the reason for that is because you can't get people to come or point to. You can't find people that are certified because they have to make a living by putting that all together. And sometimes it's really hard to find good people that have come from small schools. And I say that honestly, loving small schools. I think they're wonderful. I've had my say. Yes. Yeah, I just had a question based on what you just said. These 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 teachers or professionals, whatever, they're not getting paid based on a student. Yeah. I mean you say they they don't want to come out here for one kid. No, well, what's no, it to them? Same for like part time. No, yeah. I didn't say that. I mean for not the class, well, in some cases, classroom teachers, I don't know if all the classroom teachers here now are full time, but yeah. your other positions are all part time because you're a small school. So the school district as big as this one combined with Montpelier, they're, they're still, they're still part time. 
Yes. The teachers that work or the in Montpelier, the people you're talking about are part time. The people in Montpelier are full time because there are a lot of kids, but they are but not. But we're part of the same district. The road goes back and forth. Right, but so let's. No, no, no. What's about it? That's the way it works. Yes, but let's talk about the practicality of that. So you have a teacher, some sort of a professional that needs to be here two hours a day because that's how many kids you have and that's what's needed. So even if you hire that teacher to also do something in Montpelier, they are gonna be here in the morning for two hours a day. And then it's gonna take them time to get to Montpelier when they're not working with students, right? If that's the way you hire them and time to come back if they work here. It's all I'm saying it's a difficult situation. But don't you understand that that is, that is what the result of this bastardized union is. I mean, you know, having two districts so far apart, I mean, that's just one of the things we have to accept that people are going to spend time on the road and maybe they're not going to be, you know, at their greatest potential during that time. But, you know, that's the way it is. We have a need, it's a district wide need. This is not a separate entity here, this is part of the district. You got to remember that we. We, we were fully contained here. We didn't really feel like we needed to do anything until we were forced into it by the state. And we gave up. Our school was paid for, and now we're co-signed on a $9 million note, you know, in addition to having all these other problems. So don't tell me that these people can't, you know, they have to be part-time or anything else. You know? in, in fairness, it's all those communities voted to merge. Yeah, of course. They had to. They had no choice. It was forced upon us. Mm -hmm. And we're happy to be with Montbelier, but we expect to, to be treated as a full unit too, not to be, you know, shunted off into the on the backside of the burner. Absolutely. But that's what's happening. That's exactly what's happening. And exactly what people thought was going to happen is happening. And this is just the kind of greasing the skids here tonight. Order, and then see if other comments for the board discussion. Is it, is there any, uh, did you read yeah, well, Tom, I mean, you know, I, I was a teacher and I, I was a teacher for a couple of years. I taught elementary school in Queens. And um, there are, that, you know, to me, the home environment is the greatest predictor of success in school. Obviously. And so, but if I had to work for 0.5, if I'm, if I'm trying to drive back and forth, that's why we're going to have this kind of turn. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. people aren't going to stay in a situation where they have to drive back and forth. They're going to be applying for permanent positions. And I think that, you know, it, we can't undo the fact that the merger has occurred. Whatever the solutions are, we've got to be creative and come up with them. You know, we've got to, we, I don't know. I mean, you can't if I if I if I had a job for half the week in one place and I had to drive 30 minutes through the snow, I'd be looking for another job the following year. That's just the way it is. Well, it sounds to me like that's the way it's designed at this point. There's gotta be a solution because our children are all the ones that are at harm's way or yeah, they're lying the just because they have to there. travel back and forth. Between school and their children are still lacking the services they need, especially on the special education front. Mm -hmm. So I do have a question. Hillary gets full special ed services by certified special ed. Roxbury does it. Same district. Why? So how many kids do we have in our school that are special ed? Or can you not do that because it's below the end size? Yeah, and just to put, there's, yeah, once you get to certain numbers, you can't. So I think that that is my main concern. Like my kids are not obviously special ed. One was borderline when she was here, but because of the merger, she was not IEP specialized. So they just pretty much shuffled her to the side, even though she was behind math for three grades. Um, that was, you know, just shuffle along, shuffle along. And she is obviously getting the help that she needs at mainstream middle school. But it's because mom is also doing the side work. So I think that is a problem, you know, as Tom said, like 
where these kids come from is, you know, part of the issue. And a lot of these kids in this school have home issues. Like, obviously, you're not going to get those people's engagement. And those are the ones that matter. Because those are the parents that are just shuffling their kid and they don't even care how they behave, what they do, or what they learn. You see it when you drive out of here. Can I, um, so first I wanna just thank you all for being here today. I think uh, part of our role as board members to hear you. So like all these things, it would be really important for us to hear via email, phone calls. We are available always to be here to listen to you. And a lot of the things that we hear from community will bring back to ask the questions in the school board. I wanna make sure that we are respectful of all the communities in this district, including those who come from low income families that might not have the love as other kids. So I wanna honor them and that we are here for them. If the families don't have the time, effort, whatever we wanna call it, we're still here for the kids. And whatever decisions that we make, we are here for those kids who are not behaving those kids who are having problems, those kids that don't have food and might not be engaged in, in the classroom as we want or like have. So I think it's really important to just um, have them in our hearts when we're making these decisions. We know that the state has a shortage on special ed teachers. It's not just our district. Many of the districts in the state um, are suffering for not having a lot of teachers, certified teachers. There's a shortage on teacher workforce in this state. So it's not, it's a problem that we have that we have to deal with, but it's not that we are the only district that is having these issues right now. So just, just to have that. And the community involvement is really important. We're willing to go and sit down on the road, have coffee and like wait with signs to hear from the people. Like we talked about that, Kristen is very committed as a representative of this Roxbury district of whatever it takes for us to listen to your concerns, for us to be able to make informed decisions. And um, we need you and we thank you for being here. But we, we do need to hear the stories because we are the bridge between the work of the district and the community. So if we don't have your voice, then we are just listening from the district side and we don't really get to be able to see, okay, here are some needs that maybe Libby doesn't see uh, but that we can bridge that gap. So, uh, so I think, so thank you again. And, you know, we hope to hear you and my number and my email is on the website. I am available anytime to hear you. Thanks, Amanda. I mean, I don't think I could have articulated it any better. Um, and I just want to echo that. Um, I think that we can't know what you're experiencing unless that we hear from you. Um, I'll take it, you know, I, I posted about the meeting happening tonight, yesterday. This is a planned public meeting. Um, there is a schedule, there's a set calendar for the entire year as to when our school board meetings are happening. Every single school board meeting is an open meeting that starts off with public comment where um, your questions, concerns, frustrations, praises can be heard. Um, so I encourage folks to take advantage of that. I mean, I almost would say we're like standing room only right now in terms of our public participation. I know it's a small room, but I still think it's pretty awesome. Um, so I'm really happy to see, uh, and even though it's hard things to hear, and I'm hearing that folks are really frustrated, um, I am, I am, I am happy to hear them because we can't, we can do nothing unless we hear from you, and that is the very function of such an open meeting. Um, so I made a motion a couple weeks ago about trying to expand. Uh, where where our meeting agendas would be posted in Roxbury. Um, I can't remember what we decided, but I know that we added two additional Roxbury locations where the agendas would go. Um, you know, and I don't know what the best way is to do that. I don't know how, you know, I, we'd have to figure out and just make sure that they're in a visible place. But I would also just encourage you to go ahead and go to the MRTS website and print out the meeting calendar and put it on your fridge. So you've just got it right in front of you. So you can prioritize it if possible. We are having success with Zoom. Here in that connection, so if you can't get here physically, uh, you can still participate. But um, you know, I think I'm a new board member, only by a few months. I'm really learning about what my role and what my responsibilities are. But um, you know, clearly it is about community engagement. Like we are the bridge from you all, um, you know, to the board, and making sure that your voices and your concerns are heard. So 
I'm just grateful that you're all here and look forward to continuing to hear from you and supporting what's best for our community. Yeah, absolutely. And and now that we're physically meeting again, every fourth meeting is physically in Roxbury. Um, as Kristen has alluded to, um, Fortunate upside is the pandemic as we learned to use Zoom, so we should have most of our Montpelier meetings on Zoom as well, so which gives us the opportunity to, to view it and then also to participate in public comment. Um, and we're predictably the first and third Wednesday of every month of the change of the um, We should probably move to uh, board discussion. I'm not sure how best to structure this. I think what we want to focus on is getting the framework of a process in place. Uh, some of the questions I have and what your others. Um, you know, do we need some sort of facilitator to help us do this? Um, you know, how do we best do community outreach? And is this best handled through creation of a special committee kind of shadowing the actual research committee that we have come up? Um, I'm happy to take that. Yeah, I have some questions. Um, I'm. I want to say I want to echo the sentiments of Kristen and Amanda too. And just it's really nice to have people actually physically present and telling us your perspective. Because as a board member, it's also relatively new. But I've been on for about a year, a little over a year now. Um, I haven't heard from the Roxbury community super loudly. You know, we we did hear a little bit around the busing problem, but I didn't hear anything after that. So I wasn't sure how it all panned out. And this is the first really that I'm hearing that it actually turned into a problem. So it's like it's um, not bubbling up because the principal was contacted weekly by yeah, all of us. Yeah, I, mean, I would, so I would just not bubbling up to Libby or if it is and it's not going to you. I would encourage continued communication to school board members and all of our emails are listed publicly on the website. So if something becomes a frustration for you and you're not getting the feedback that you want from the administration, then I would encourage you to forward those emails on, or maybe just as a matter of course, if you're making a complaint, always CC all of us on it, just so that we can follow along with what's happening in Roxbury, because we don't hear a lot from the community. And I know it's really challenging. There's a barrier of entry to, to get to board meetings and to read the agendas and to understand where we're at in the process. But um, as far as I know, and this is just my perspective as somebody that's only been on the board for a little over a year, is that tonight really is day one in this process. And tonight is the first time that I'm hearing of the, of the um, June 30th date, actually. So I don't know what that process looks like myself. So you're here on the ground level of this process, and you're probably the most important stakeholder. You know, the Roxbury Village community is going to be in my perspective, probably the most important stakeholder to hear from because coming here tonight, I wasn't sure what are we, what are we coming into? What is, I, I've also worked for small schools and you know, what are we coming into? Are we coming into a community who loves their school and wants to make sure that um, they preserve it exactly the way that it is? Or are we coming from a school that 50% of the parents want to send their kids to union school? Or I, I just really don't know. And so it's really important for people to voice um, their feelings on it. So if there's any way for you to form a community coalition, a, a group of people that meets regularly while we're engaging in this process and we're getting our, you know, the ground under us in this process, maybe you could also sort of organize on your end so that you're sending representatives to our meetings on this topic and making sure that your voices are heard. So it's very important. So I really appreciate you all being here. And it's been insightful to hear your stories. Um, so I guess that's my first question is what is the, the June 30th date? And what exactly does that mean? So the June 30th date, um, I mean, the biggest thing is basically when, when the merger came, you know, there was a discussion about possible school closure. And it was just basically a guarantee that no school closure decision would be made without the vote of an electorate for four years. So basically, either community could protect any of their schools from closure in a bubble term. So once that expires, then a school closure could occur through the normal process, which I'm totally sure, but my understanding is 
it would be a recommendation from the board and then we'd have to get approval from the state board. So it, it could happen outside of, so. It would so, not so, go to a vote. It would Electro, not go would to not a go vote. Like electoral vote? Okay, okay, that's interesting. So it would be a decision, a vote of the board, of the school board, and then that vote would then be approved by the state board. Yes. Can I talk a related question onto that? Um, just uh, as far as the wording, electorate of the municipality, I assume it says the municipality, does that mean both Roxbury and Tom? Yeah. Okay, so that's- Yeah, so if we were to close Union, the city of Montpelier would have to vote to reach a vote. Okay, and then if RBS- If RBS, is, yeah, the town of Roxbury would have to vote. But Montpelier residents would not vote on Montpelier that. residents would not Exactly. So, so essentially, Roxbury would have a veto over the closure of RBS. Are you sure? Until June. Until June. Until June. Honestly, it's a moot point because we're not going to have a vote right for June 30th, <laughs> right? 2022. Yeah. This is not going to happen at this point. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. Right. I mean, I'm with sorry, that, I got confused. If the school closure will be voted by the board. And then submit to the state board. And then what was this other part? If it were to happen before that date. Oh, right I there. see. Okay. Yeah, I just so, want a clarification. On that. Okay. I, but I also want to clarify and sort of maybe set some people's hearts at ease a little bit that I have not heard any talk among any of these board members or even the community asking us to close the school. So I don't think that that timeline is anything to be concerned about as far as what my experience has been on this board. It's a very thoughtful, deliberate board that's not going to like railroad any decision through, especially not something this critical and important and, and you know, changing the fabric of your community in a in within a year. I just don't see that happening. Yeah, yeah, I would echo that. I mean, and, and as a Montpelier resident, uh, at a a lot of board members have served on the merger committee. You know, my sense is that support in Montpelier for both the merger, merge district, and for the school and the community are very, very high. Um, you know, that said, I, I think, you know, as, as we look towards the future and some of the numbers that will be put out, we want to improve, we definitely want to improve the performance of RBS. And from you know, hearing things tonight, it sounds like, you know, and I've been hearing this through other channels, you know, there are issues that, that need to be addressed and you know we want to have that be part of this process to make sure that um you know when we come back in a year in a year or two years uh the stories we're hearing are increased enrollment um you know fantastic educational experiences uh you know uh, just you know not some issues that we're hearing tonight so so that's that's the yeah Right. You're muted, Mia. Yeah. Thank you. Has everyone else gone who wanted? Oh, well, I guess I'm next on the list. <laughs> um, I'll just chime in that absolutely, I think we should hire a facilitator to hold this process. Uh, it, I think that's the best way to get it done in a really thoughtful and thorough way, um, in a way that a, a facilitator is, I think, the person who could ensure that all those that we get that um, input from community members, whether they are the kind of people who show up at school board meetings and can show up at school board meetings or the, the kind that, that can or don't. Um, and I think, and one thing that I'm realizing is going to be really, really critical. And I know we're, you know, whatever decision we land on is not going to please every single person in, in our school community. But I would really love for us to see, to, to hold this process in a way that brings our community together, our full school community together, rather than divides us. And I think that we need someone to hold the, hold the process in order for that to happen. I think if we, as a board, were trying to do it ourselves, um, I, I would be concerned that that wouldn't be possible. So I, I definitely wanted to just answer that one question, one of the questions that was at the end of Libby's presentation with, from my perspective, yes, we definitely need to hire a facilitator. Um, I have a couple of questions as well. Um, 
are we in this conversation and in this process focusing only on RVS or is it a holistic um, view of all district properties? And I guess, it, and maybe that can't be answered tonight, but I have a little bit of confusion around what the, um, what the focus is. Um, you know, that, that first, I, I thought that first slide Libby was very helpful because I think that actually does bring it up to the bigger picture and that this isn't just about RVS and Roxbury, but it's, it's a way of thinking about how are we using all of our facilities in a way that um, bolster students learning. But then I also feel a little bit of concern that this is really, the focus is only going on, um, on RVS. Um, so maybe that's not something that can be answered tonight, but I'll just pause there to see if someone does have thoughts on that question. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer though, because there, I think this absolutely has to do with, with all of the buildings. I mean, I think obviously we have a situation at RVS that um, maybe is more urgent than some of the buildings, but as you've seen, there's a need in the middle school to find more space. Um, and, uh, you know, I think a process that looks holistically at solutions that, you know, is is there just to just throw it out there, is an ability to bring kids from Montpelier to Roxbury because this is a fantastic location. I mean, it's a gorgeous building. It's a relatively new building. It's got outdoor and other amenities that we don't have in our more urban spaces in, in Montpelier. You know, is there a way to attract Montpelier students out here to, you know, Build the, you know, fill up some of the vacant space at this school, um, and uh, maybe with higher numbers get some some other improvements as well. So I think, yeah, you know, looking at that whole question is is very important. I think, yeah, you know, we want to look at RBS from a district wide perspective, and with the other resources that we have at the district. Okay, thank you. Uh, that I'm good. Yeah, so I would say like, yes, for a facilitator, but I think maybe multiple facilitators, I think that there are two things. One, one is a conversation about not outside facilitators and I know what Roxbury does with kids, right? Like, so if, if we could find somebody from inside the Roxbury, it would be ideal to at least guide that person, someone that can get paid from the community to advise this facilitator, how the process, how the community, you know, walks and talks so that we could like, where are the spaces where people are at so that we could do that community engagement in a very holistic way. I think there's also the conversation around not only the space in the building, but what are the issues that are happening. So, you know, great, like as back rate, a special ed and and looking at that through that lens, because I think that's really important. It's not just the building, it's like if our if we don't have special educators that are like working, if our kids are having issues to terms of the teacher workforce, that says a lot about how we move forward. So I think like yes, the facilitators, but maybe a couple, and maybe like being able to hire someone from Roxbury that can advise us into how to support the community in this conversation. Because I think someone from the outside doesn't have what we need, really, unless we live in wait. Good one person. Is it possible, since the whole COVID thing has put everything on hold for 15 months, that we could move this June 30th date back 15 months? Petition the state. Department of Education and the longer change that date so that we don't feel pressurized to turn everything over to, to the seven of you. Yeah, we don't have to do anything yeah, by June 30th. Yeah, we don't do anything by June no, 30th. No, but legally by June 30th, the, the community loses all um, all control. Literally. Because we have one or two members, I'm not sure, you guys are both voting members. Yeah, so we have two out of the seven or eight or however many there are. So we literally lose all control of, the, of our education process as of June 30th, literally. So if we could get that moved back 15 months, at least it would give people time to 
I mean, I didn't even know about this meeting until I saw Kristen's uh, front porch forum post. I mean, why is it such a secret? And what good is it to have a year's worth of dates when you're going to have meetings when there's no agendas attached to those dates? You know, people come to meetings based on the agenda material that's going to be discussed. I mean, people go to select board meetings when the roads are going to be discussed. They come here when the whatever, you know. So what is it? Why why is it so hard to get that information out? Front porch forum has been around for a while and everybody reads it. And North, Northfield, Roxbury, people can read the Montpelier forum, and you can post it on the Roxbury forum, if that's not too much to ask. I mean, the agenda, the whole bit. I mean, if you hadn't done it, it would have been... Yeah, I mean, I think this prompts just a conversation amongst the board of how we're getting information to community members about when meetings are happening and what the content is. Um, I mean, I would agree with you and that, you know, from Porch Forum is just sort of like the new town crier, right? I mean, it's what everybody reads and takes in. And so that's, you know, a great um, just kind of megaphone, you know, that's, that's the only one we have. Yeah. So um, I think that's, I think that's worthy of consideration, um, you know, and there, there is an agenda that is attached to each meeting. It doesn't come out months and months in advance. The agendas come out on the Friday before the, the upcoming Wednesday meeting. So those, the agenda and the supporting meeting documents and resources are all publicly available to folks. Um, so, but I think what you're highlighting is that we could do a better job of letting folks know when meetings are. Seriously, you know, they don't have time to research all this stuff inside yeah. the meeting. Yeah. Uh, Jill? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. well, what about the question, the legal question of setting that date back? I mean, it sounds like that's... I, I think we'd have to probably go through like a vote to amend the the merger agreement, and mm -hmm. I don't know. Most people feel differently. I I think the the chance of the school closing, any school closing by June thirtieth, twenty twenty two, or frankly June thirtieth, twenty twenty five, is pretty close to zero. I don't think there's any talk about it. No, I agree. About, I'm just wondering yeah. um, if there would be something that we could do to sort of publicly indicate. And, and I get Tom's yeah. point about it's out of the community stand yeah. at that point because after that date, it would be a vote by the board and then the state board, and that it wouldn't go to a vote of the town. Yeah. And so, if that would be something that we could legally amend, I would be open to that because because I agree with you I mean, that I don't think this. the board is in any rush to make this happen any sooner than that. So, and I agree with Tom that. Committee is going to want to control it, and that we should find a way to make that piece by piece. Yeah. I mean, if we don't intend to do that, it's always because it's legal, we should, you know, because we took, we are behind, it is our responsibility to ensure that we have something to do. Do you want to check with the state board? <laughs> like, Would it be a future conversation? conversation? Or that be <laughs> yeah, I, have no, I mean, we could we could tie our own hands. We could just take a vote that we won't oh, yeah, school closure yes. until commit. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that's, yeah. I don't but think that's not the point. School closure. He's concerned about the vote. Yeah, that yeah. it would be allowed to go to a vote. Yeah. I mean, right? Like uh, we, we we could certainly look into it. My my guess is it would probably need whatever process is needed to um, go back and vote. Yeah, because this was like a. Was, well, but it went through the whole Act 46 process, and I think to change any part of it, you have to kind of redo the Act 46 process. And it was publicized at the time of the merger. Yeah. So we could make some sort of motion tonight to. But I mean, to, to say that we won't take any action to close any of our schools. With you know, and push it out however long we wanted to push it out if we wanted to make a motion tonight, but that wouldn't alleviate Tom's concern about it going to a public vote. Yeah. But we could at least do that as sort of until we are able to get legal counsel on that other question. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely I, I can check to what some of them. So I'll take responsibility for checking. What the legal avenue would be and what would need to happen in order for this program to 
for that piece on the community website. And I'm just interested in indicating our patients on moving any process forward and that we, we want to have a process with fidelity and stakeholder input and would be would have no interest in doing it by 6 30 2022 so I, I just want to make sure to be able to if there's anything that we can do tonight to um you know make that promise to the Roxbury community I think that would be nice. I'll agree with Jim. If you make a committee and get a facilitator and start the discussion, we'd be lucky to come to any kind of right. project. And it will take you probably longer than that if you want to come to a conclusion. And once you come to the conclusion in June, you're whether you had to plan the year way in advance of that. So, you know, it's going to be another year exactly. at the very least. Right. It takes a long time. Sure. I don't have an answer to all of that, <laughs> um, but I, I did. I did just want to say a few things while I had the floor. I, um, you know, I think as Emma pointed out, there's no preconceived notion here. I actually didn't really see this as the agenda item that has become. I'm really glad we're having this conversation because, frankly, what I've heard tonight has become my number one concern. I think we all come at this from our own lens. So for me, this past year, having my kids at the middle school went really well. I was really upset about the wasp infestation that was continuing in her classroom. So that was like what was right in front of my face. But to hear that there are concerns about things that are coming up in a month or two about busing and special education and behavior um, is, is beyond the scope of this larger committee building long-term plan. That thing has to happen, but but I wanna make sure that we are taking your concerns seriously about the things that are happening now to your kids right now. I, I will never forget, we had a parent come a couple months ago. One person had her piece about how we had failed her, her son and it still sticks with me. So I don't wanna lose track of those more immediate things that might also have more immediate and, and doable resolutions and lose that in this bigger sort of what are we going to do with our buildings what's our community who's happy about where we're at who's not um so i just wanted to make that point you know that that i have heard some community members who are very concerned about the numbers we saw i'm really concerned about the scores and things knowing that there's more to that story but to hear that clearly your kids aren't getting what they need and the system that we have isn't working is is point number one that i've heard tonight um and that I need to look beyond my little bubble about middle school being a not great place for drop off and busing and they have nowhere to play. This is a beautiful school. It was really neat to come down here and see that. And, and but I'm really sad to hear that it's not working. So I want, I, I feel like we almost need to separate those two things and make sure that we are sort of prioritizing the experience of the kids and the staff here at the school this fall to make sure that it's a little bit more successful. Um, and, and then, you know, and then that longer term concern, we can't really make these decisions in isolation. So there definitely isn't a preconceived notion. I genuinely would want to hear if you guys have ideas about what's going to happen or what would work better for your children. I have no preconceived notion about the answer, but I know that simply closing the building doesn't eliminate problems. And I also know that, you know, other schools are busting at the seams. So it's, you know, you squeeze the system one side here, something else happens. So I think Tina articulated best of saying what we're doing right now isn't working. So let's talk about solving that. But I also just wanted to make sure we don't lose sight of these like really immediate concerning pieces and that the principal hears this and that the teachers are given what they need. They need to provide that better experience for your kids and that you don't have to worry about how your kindergartner is going to get on a bus in a month. I, you know, I have a 13 year old now. She doesn't want me to help her do anything, but I absolutely <laughs> like your concerns have now become incredibly important to me and I'm just not aware of that. So thank you. Um, so in terms of, of next steps, there seems to be relative agreement on the facilitator. Um, when we started the process, we were really working with Susan and Keisha, right? Yeah, we had gotten a, an early proposal, whatever, like 15 months ago. Yeah. Um, so we'd have to, I'd probably start over. For a Yeah, probably. The requirements and yeah, basically not. So we have like other RFP. Oh, 
Oh, it's within. No, we just got one relief proposal and then okay. stuff happens. <laughs> I'm also wondering if what needs to precede the RFP is just a really clear articulation of our purpose. Yeah, yeah. I remember you know, our, our process, so, obviously, I mean, the, yeah. the community is really going to inform uh the process but our purpose and i think that's frankly a lot of what brought you all here tonight is that the purpose felt really unclear um so i think that we maybe as a board need to really clarify that and maybe that's the um that's where the committee comes in i think we still might have some documentation about that because we did talk about what we want out of it at least we started that and and i mean maybe and this is an opportunity for some historical context without going on on and on but was the process that was initiated last there specific to RBS, and is that different no. than what we're doing now? So it was no, it was wide. it was it was about the vision for the for both schools to bring the the schools closer together to you know, think outside the box and yeah, all yeah, the so, yeah. the buildings. What's the vision for the for the, for the one unit yeah. instead of having two divided yeah. communities? Yeah, sorry, mm -hmm. Mia. Can you hear? Are you? Can you? Hear? Oh, I was. I was That's okay. Up. Thank you. So we need a committee. Yeah, it sounds like we need. I mean, do we do we want to charge an existing board committee to to come up with the charge or? I'm looking at Jill. I'm feeling so side out. I, oh, I yeah. want you to be the committee. <laughs> I feel like I feel like we need to. I would. I might. I, I think the committee would be like, make sense. That's, that's yeah. why I'm side in out some anyway. capacity. But there's clearly other mm -hmm. stuff that is not that would not just be the facilities. But as far as like taking an inventory about our facility resources and, and possibilities, I know when we. When I first, I've only been on the board a year, but when we were first together, it was right before COVID hit, we were talking about the middle school because that is, that building is That's in a crisis and yes. what the options are. Do we close the middle school and move those kids to a new building in, at the high school? No, that doesn't work because X, Y, Z. So there's there's moving pieces and parts that I absolutely think would have to be part of the conversation. Um, you and I are two are, thirds of the you guys as a building committee. Yeah, I mean, they could come up with. Could you come up with a charge, or would you be willing to do that? I don't know if that's the purpose of that committee. Yeah, that's true. I feel. I feel like we we're talking about an educational opportunities yeah. committee. That's a much bigger conversation than the building. Mm -hmm. If um, I may, the original intent behind the original proposal was the idea that when I win the Powerball and I retire immediately. That you all have a vision for this district, right? It has to start there. Um, and the vision statement that's on our letterhead sounds very nice. And I think it was wordsmithed across the board meeting and a half. Is that fair? <laughs> and it didn't involve a whole lot of community members other than board members. And so the whole intent there was to start there. And then come down to, and how do we get to that vision using the resources that we have in the district? Mm -hmm. um, well, you win the Power Bowl, you better have a succession plan. <laughs> <laughs> that's the next thing. Uh, that's the next one. But I, so I, I'm hearing a lot of things because I, like, I'm thinking the equity committee is thinking a lot about community engagement. So it can naturally go in there in terms of, so because I, I feel like now there are four different conversations. One is vision. One is like the building capacity and like the other one is like, what are the equity issues that we're having with children with IEP or like behavioral? And there is uh, the issue about how do we engage in the community that is both in Montpelier and Roxbury. So I think for the purpose of this conversation and from that you guys are here is like, how do we engage the Roxbury community not only about the school closure, but about the issue. There is no school closure. No. I just have, well, uh, yeah. 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 about the non-school closure. Okay. Of the yeah. school. <laughs> about the June 30th and all the conversation that we're having today. So I think that that is, so I think that kind of fits in the equity community in terms of the community engagement. Sure. And the facilities has its own. For the chart. Would it be possible to, uh, I guess, can we engage the facilitator and help? 
determine the scope actually of what we want to do because I feel like at least you know I don't want to sound broken record but time is always an issue. It, this is something that really requires focus and time and somebody who's maybe a professional to coordinate the conversation in a way that's that's your job to do. Whereas, you know, it's me like, oh, I have 10 minutes, can I quickly do something? It's, I don't feel like that would be a fair way to do it. I mean, maybe other people have more experience than I would think. I feel like it's a really important conversation and the, the beginning of it is, is critical. You know, building the foundation is critical. So I just don't want us to do that in any way. Yeah, no, that's my sense. I mean, and I mean the when we did the Act 46 committee, yeah, you know, obviously we had guidance from the state about how it's supposed to do it. And then we had Steve Dale facilitate, and it was yeah, it was a, a committee with you know strong representation from both communities, but with Steve scoping it out and keeping everyone on task and doing there's a definitive process that was defined yeah. for you. It was defined for us. It made it a lot easier. I mean, I think we could come up with, with a similar process, but we'd have to embed it our, ourselves. Yeah. So um, even if we, even if it wasn't the same person, just a person who would, because as you know, you have to take notes. You have to, you know, do research. You have to put those into some kind of report. Form. I mean, all these things take hours and hours to do. So, yes, yeah, I think you need it's a big enough question that you need a committee for just this. That's my And thought. you need a facilitator to do it. And I, if I ran the world, I would say the board needs to decide the purpose of it. But then the committee needs to consider, needs to have on it a couple board members and community members from both Montpelier and Roxbury who would represent the community and go out and try to figure out what's needed. That'd be my opinion. Um, so it sounds like we need somebody to write. You were saying that you we would want a purpose defined before we would hire the facilitator so that the facilitator would know what they're getting into before. And I am happy to take the Honda and the Equity Committee up on at least drafting that and then it could come back to us perhaps on the August 4th. Could it come back by August 4th, maybe? <laughs> Is that our chair, Mia Moore? I keep adding things to the equity. I'm not the chair. I'm not the chair. <laughs> uh, but we could, yeah. Um, and then we can still vote sure on could. Yeah, and, and then maybe the facilitator with the, some committee members could actually write a draft charge for us to vote on, but the purpose would be defined ahead of time before hiring the facilitator. I, I agree completely with what you said, because what I'm hearing tonight is not about buildings, it's about educational outcomes yeah. and experiences for these kids. And so the building, the physical stuff is the last piece of that once we've actually set our goal for making sure we're providing this. That I do think it is an equity issue. Like yeah. So I think you're I think you're right on. And I think the building is tertiary. So that's that's a supply thing that is available once we have carved out the educational outcome issues. So I think it's like the purpose and then an RFP to hire a facilitator and the RFP process is like could be the development of like could be a collaboration between some community members with like brainstorming what what is the need for this RFP and like drafting that to come to you know so I'm looking at this the schedule um the fourth we've got SR3 and funding option which is going to be a full meeting. Under Fame, we can introduce a draft, spend a couple of quick minutes, and then spend time on the 18th with the guys. Well, like we said, we're, we're I think everyone has sort of expressed that we're not in any rush and we want to do this process with, with fidelity. So I don't think I don't see any rush to have it done by August 4th. Well the purpose could be yeah. we do want to we want to get the ball rolling on 
So with the purpose, and then the purpose is voted by the board, which also gives them the room to begin the conversation with some community members to draft an RFP that will come back. I mean, I just think voting on a purpose would probably be pretty fast. Yeah, let's look at the purpose. If it becomes a larger discussion, though, let's plan to you know table it up to 15 minutes and, and revisit on the 18th. But if, it, if everyone kind of has consensus on the purpose, we should. I do have another question, Heidi, if you're still open to all the comments. <laughs> I was just going to make a recommendation for a local uh, facilitator. Okay. I, don't, I don't know. You know, you all know Peter Evans. Principal in Northwood. He doesn't live in Roxbury, he lives in Northwood, but he taught here years ago. He knows the community really well. And also, um, Lucinda Sullivan, who's our town wide, either one of those two, if you could help me do it, it would be perfect. And usually, when committees like this are formed, we would include community members on that committee. So. Oh, absolutely. I think it would be great for the Roxbury community members that are here tonight to start brainstorming with who you might want to see on that committee. So I'm sorry. Were you guys saying that, that Steve Dale put together, like we actually have something in the box that we could open that box back up and pick up? Or is that I sort mean, of obsolete by now? We, we certainly had the X46 process, which could mimic if we wanted to. I mean, it was, it was a series of meetings, you know, with relatively equal representation um so right before I think COVID, began yeah. with the issues of what are the facts yeah. Yeah. you know just like let me begin with them but they're not yeah clear yeah. yeah. yet but not all of them you need to anybody on the committee needs to hear the facts hear what's happening in Mount Hillier, hear what's happening in Rockbury, hear what you want to happen in there and then you can go on yeah no and, and we met many times in this room and had similar turnouts where we just we, we listened a lot we took um, you know, took information put it together and, you know, and, and brought a package to the voters so, but, I, but i think that you know getting community members from both communities doing a lot of outreach to find those members and the members who um, understand the communities and also have to have the time to put into it so would people be open to me trying trying on a motion for size about extending our any decision making on closing our buildings or how are people doing? I'm gonna ask for I'm gonna ask we can do both. We could do that in the meantime. But or we can wait. Yeah, I would definitely entertain that. Um, well, I'm on the saying that maybe wait until we get the answer on pushing the deadline out. <laughs> so, like, if we can push that the actual deadline out for community vote and input to you know another year or so legally, then that would be preferable over just pushing a commitment to from us to the to our community to not take action. But I know you're looking at your agendas, your future agendas and where it can fit. So we can, I mean, yeah, I have no I mean, I think we can get the answer pretty quickly about what the process would be to extend or change that. Um, yeah, we could do that as the step one. And then if, if that seems extremely bureaucratic and involved, then we could do a vote okay. to get people more comfortable. So that'll be our plan B. Yeah. <laughs> and I would argue too, I, I don't see, I think that's put in there as part of Act 46 language yes. for the worst possible case scenario of like a hostile takeover. And, and I, yeah. I think it would be really irresponsible any board, I don't see this board doing that to not proceed with, you know, keep picking on the middle school because it's easy to pick on because my neighborhood school if we were going to do that, it impacts both communities. It would require a lot of community discussion and input. Even if at the end of the day, the board formally votes, it's the responsibility of the board to like 
reflect that community sentiment. I don't think it would just happen in a vacuum. Yeah. Yeah. That's like too bad, so sad. So, but I, I think that's what that that was put in there. I remember when the legislature was drafting Act 46, there there was that concern that you know, all right, six months from now, this new school board is just gonna uh, clean house, and, and that yeah. that did not come to fruition. Yeah, and I think like there's a tumor. Yeah, similar. I've been on three committees to discuss <laughs> what we do with Main Street. And you notice it's still there. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So, so the equity committee is going to. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think I was just about to do what you're about to do, Jim. So I'm going to let you do it and just listen. Okay, uh, so the equity committee, um, chaired by Mia, is is going to- I'm not the chair. Okay. Uh, is gonna to put together a purpose that we will look at at August 4th, um, uh, hopefully for approval, but if, if the determination is this, that it requires further discussion, we can table the committee. Um, and, and that purpose will define next steps, which it sounds like Will likely involve the hiring of a facilitator and the formation of some sort of broad based multi community. And so the community is our funding, make those recommendations of like what you bring up in that survey that we send out to the listen to the podcast. We do that until we know the purpose, right? Oh, but for the which is a just for, this, for yeah. the SR3 funding. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a federal funding, federal funding associated with COVID. So, um, survey just went out about oh, about yeah. Survey for yeah. So those those you know immediate needs for this building right now. Um, the homes are so, right, there are other ways to get your hands on on some solutions for some of the more immediate problems. So if there's a special ed, you know, a lack of special ed uh, licensed teachers or something like that. That information would be really important for us to hear in terms of allocating these ESSER funds, or maybe even other funds. If there's if there's some if, if money could help solve the problem or any of the problems. Oh, oh, Joe. I'm sorry. Maybe this is out of order. I didn't know if maybe at a future meeting I really hate to ask you, but we talked about busing last year. I wonder if we could give some sort of reassurance at a future meeting about what the busing schedule is. I know COVID is a little bit less of a concern. I know that the busing company has a hard time finding staff, just like all of us are. Mm -hmm. But is there any like immediate, like, do you feel like the busing is in better shape than it might have been last year? I don't run the bus company, so I have yet to talk to a bus company manager. Should I get an email from her today? So we get a so maybe before the August, the last August. Is that a board meeting agenda? Yeah. I feel like we talked about it last year. We did. Yeah. Stacy came because yeah. of those yeah. challenges that yeah. she was having hiring staff last year. Okay. And I suspect there will be staff challenges because all companies are having big problems with drivers right now. So last year it was a budget question because it was going to be very expensive to have a bus during no. COVID, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We asked the we asked the board that first. The yeah. board wanted us to continue to spend money for a, for the small amount of students. And the board said yes. So then the bus ran that we had to charge. She had some to rent right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think just which, that's is, the a yeah. Yeah. which is a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a difference. Yeah. Yeah. We do think you're right. The conversation should start. Yeah. Yeah. Because you have family. So it just says people can plan. Well, I don't know. What we're going to know, really, she's probably going to say we're trying. We're looking for people. Or... Yeah, we, we can definitely. Um, just... Maybe look at. Can I just add one thing? Maybe look at all the options. Like maybe you don't need that big old bus because we don't have COVID and there's probably what nine kids now between the three parents that are here that ride the bus. So maybe 
Yeah. Five is when we get on the clean stuff. Yes. So um, <laughs> maybe look at a short bus or a van or some sort of look at all the options. So I think that's part of it that the, there wasn't another smaller option. Yeah. I yeah. think that I think that came uh, up. I I was told that it was COVID and it was a spatial issue. It wasn't that it wasn't available. So let's just look at all the options. Great. Well, I really appreciate all the fantastic input on this. Um, and you know, too long since the board has come here, obviously due to COVID, but um, it's been super helpful. I appreciate your your practice and you know, this is something we really want to hear more and more from the Rockford community as 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 we move forward. Um, let's move on to policy monitoring. We have four policy monitoring reports uh, to approve. Um, uh, let's start with FO5 education records. Can, can I quickly say one more thing to people before they leave? Just on, on our website where it, where it lists our meeting schedule and our agendas, it also says meeting location. So if you're interested in attending the ones that are here at Roxbury, that's already laid out for us with which dates we're going to be here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure you don't want to hear about the policy. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to have kids today. <laughs> <laughs> about the same thing. They have, they have kids. Um, it's fine. Can I use a lot? No, that's taken. Yeah. Uh, is this our with FO5 education records? Um, do you have a motion to approve FO5? Just with that change, yes, thank you. It's a typo change? Yes. I um, move to approve. Uh, make that change. Uh, do you have a second? I'll second. Any discussion? Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, FO7 alcohol and drugs, student alcohol and drugs. Um, motion to approve. I move that we approve policy FO7 student alcohol first. Um, do you have a second? Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Um, policy F19 limited education, English, limited English proficiency students. Um, do I have a motion to approve F19? Sure. Um, so it said, I think there are 35 students. Is that number still active? At the end of the 2020 2021 okay. year. And then there are 2.6 FPEs. FPEs. And so their job entirely is to just work, make sure that it's not only the students, but the entire family. Um, it's language services. Basically. No. Oh, well, okay. our our 2.6 FT works with students. I mean, they obviously work with families as well as okay. part of that, but it, they're not giving language services to the family. Okay, I just thought it was something that I had to teach. But, um, I request something they help them do. They do generally, oh, they're good people. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Well, it, and it's also the law is a matter of some translation. Or, yeah. 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 So, and then there was a link in there, but at least for me, it didn't work. Yeah. Nothing happened oh. when I clicked that link. So oh, it's on our, um, it's a link to the, it's just directions for how to use the translation of like anything that goes wrong. It's, it's on the MRPS. Website. So when okay. I say website, okay. it's on the quick links at yeah. the top. Okay. Yeah. I, I would like to discuss this. Google translation is not a good measure to have families go to Google Translate to rely on that translation as someone who works with ill families uh, in other districts and, um, <laughs> and with does quite a lot of translation. I don't think that Google is a reliable service to give families or to put families to be, hey, translate this to go to Google and so 
I think that we, um, I think there has to be different conversations around, you know, like it, it is our, the law to translate some of these documents to families who do request the language access. And um, I think that, did you say in one of the reports that it was like nine families that request translation? Sure. Okay. So, so I think for those at least, like the our policies and our documents should be translated um, if we're going to support the families. So, um, many districts have translate their documents. Uh, they have, we have two organizations in the state. Uh, who have translation services. The district already works with a translation company, which is a little pricey, more pricey than other ones, but there are different ways. The state, you know, is also advocating for language access and, and language justice and some and, and all of these things. So I think that as a, as someone who grew up as an English second language whose mom didn't speak who got bullied, who my mom didn't understand what, why I was being expelled and the policies because they were never written to her. And that's my experience now that I'm bringing this, I would like to, maybe we can meet with it or like the Sylvia, you know, they, they do great job and they work. I saw how much they work in the blog and how much they translate to common language, your memos, especially around COVID uh, to simplify the language, but I don't think we, should expect families to go on like Google to tell them to Google and put it on the website. Um, and so I think that any policy and any work that we do is not just for the families here, but like for the future. And like when we're like doing this is like long-term longevity that we have to come with nine families, nine languages. I think there's only like four families that actually request translation. So that's the in my view, that's like the bare minimum. Yes, translate <laughs> to those three languages. Um, my experience <laughs> is also that once the kids leave the middle, the elementary school, when the parents start losing the advocacy, high school, the kids translate for themselves or they already learn English, but the families are still not getting um, the language, the documents in the language that they So I think that I would love to like really say any family that, that asks for translations for the meetings we should be translating our policies and our instruction manual the district manual into those languages and that we're not talking about thousands and thousands of dollars the budget should not be and are we doing that translating some of so the the EL teachers work with each individual teacher and each individual family as to what their needs are. And so that's how that work happens. And they have an individual plan for every one of those 35 kids. So they do get a translation? That's where I think it translated. Some documents from the district get translated. Are all policies translated? No. So what is, I don't understand the Google translation. So I know link. that, but I mean, it, is that, I guess, so pretend like I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what, what the current process is. For translating, it sounds oh, no, like that's not the term. When kid, when a parent asks for translation, we don't send it to Google Translate. Okay, that's we, what I was we're, getting. We're, we have people on retainer for that. that. Yeah. Okay. But when you say any communication from the district or school can be translated through our website, directions can be found here. Is that what you're talking about? Is that what Amanda is referencing? It's sort of a Google Translate feature. Not every communication is translated. But I mean, that sentence is referring to, or can, could you direct me? I'm looking at the website right now. Can you direct me to where it is? Yep, very quickly. Yep. Questions and interpretation? Yep. Based on our website URL. Okay, so that's what it's referencing in that sentence. Click here for directions. 
it's just directing if they have any questions they can you can paste the url the problem that i see with this is just that i i try to go use because my husband's norwegian so i've tried to go to Nor norway like websites and it's just like there's nothing on there for me as an english speaker to even know how to navigate to this page so i could imagine that people that speak a different language would even have trouble knowing what quick links means, what translate, you know, what the next translation and interpretation, like that's all in a foreign language. So it might be nice to have something, I don't know if it's possible, but like a dream come true scenario might be like little buttons in the major languages that are spoken in our district yeah. to a page like this that's already translated into that language. I know that's like, might would take a while and would be technical, but that would be really nice for someone who's not English not speaking really. to see their you language. Can, you can get this done online, so do this now. But it, it's so, so the thing is like, I, mean, I don't mean online translation, okay. I mean a real person. Yeah. I'm just saying yeah. you can, there are websites where you can go to find translators. Translation services and on who, websites. will do, you know, the back web page for you. Yeah. yeah. So I would imagine there's only, like you're saying, maybe four or five predominant languages that are being requested? So in 2019, there were, I think I sent that data. Um, and this was because I know because I was working with the UES parents that they would want to make sure the parents group is uh, accessible to our dealer families. And I've been talking about doing some of the translations of the document that we just finished. So I asked, uh, before I was a board member, I asked Sylvia uh, if she could give us the, the, all the languages that were spoken at UES specifically, and who, where were the languages that we requested uh, that that could be translated. And she gave me a list of five. These were 2019. 19 languages are or like, I forget how many, 19 languages are spoken at UES, and five are the ones that are requested. Um, and and so I know that Hannah and then the is a telehealth telephone services they can access through like if families want it. But speaking with some of the families that it really doesn't really work for some of that. And, but so like what I'm saying is like to give accessibility is like if we want the like at least the policies, the bare minimum should be like our our manual should be in the hands of families. This is how I enroll my kid, and this is the language I am requesting. And so I know what the school is like, right? Like, we are also talking, like, Hannah and Sylvia don't speak those five languages. Um, so it's, it's not. So, what I'm saying is, like, let's offer what we are offering all the kids that are requesting translation. It is the law to give them accessibility in some of these things. So, let's just, it's five of whatever languages the EL department says it is. Again, I'm not taking data to the um, for the incoming families, they should know the rules. I'll give you an example. There was a family when Isa started, my daughter started kindergarten, who speaks Maya Lama, beautiful, very committed to her child. This is when we were doing the field trips. And there was a lot of issues trying to figure out like what were the requirements, whether to go in the bus. The teacher asked me to give her a ride because she really wanted to go, but they were not allowed in the bus. There was a lot of lack of communication. Like, so I had to, like, I couldn't go take her because I wasn't going to a field trip, but I was trying to find somebody else. There was just like this third communication that in my life I was like, this was a policy that was that year, the, the volunteering policy. So sometimes I should have been translated for her so she could understand that these were the rules, this is the fingerprint process, all of that, that it took a while. So that if at the beginning, Ms. Mela could have been like, here's the policy, she could have understood it. Yeah. I think so, that there is policy. Maybe this is a dumb question, but wouldn't we just update the policy to say what we want? And then, and then it's a very there. minimal policy. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Like, wouldn't we just update the policy and say, this is what we want. That's it. Yeah. So let's just do that. 
Right, because right now it just says has equitable access to school programs as required by law. Right. So, you know, talking about translating the website or being more open to different languages on our website probably wouldn't even fall under this policy. Yeah, we could just make it more explicit. And there's not a procedure, is that right? But uh, available on our website? Or, or the S19 policy? Unless the policy dictates the need for a procedure, there is a policy. I think the policy says um, the superintendent or his or her designee shall be responsible for developing and implementing procedures to comply with the open state laws. So does that implementing. Mean so we set the policy, at least this but develop, is we don't we don't develop and develop procedures, right? We right. develop right. procedures. So, so those procedures aren't specific to this policy, right? So procedures on the school board page that are part of this monitoring process will be when the policy says the superintendent will create a policy or procedure to make this policy happen. Right. Okay. So we have a process through our EL educators to ensure that the law is followed and that they're doing the government, you know, like all of those things. Uh, that's part of their job responsibilities that I have to ensure that they do, right? We do the evaluation and the mm -hmm. uh, supervision process, but there's not a, this policy is not asking for a very specific procedure and how it's to be carried out. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? It does make sense. It's always like a little bit challenging for me to, to like, I can't interpret that sentence that way on my own, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I appreciate your interpretation of it, but it's one of the like sort of ongoing roadblocks for me on being on the policy committee is I never really know when it's, when it requires a, a procedure or when it doesn't require a procedure. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a good question that it is for development and implementing procedures to comply with federal and state law. So those procedures don't necessarily will be attached to this policy. Right. Okay, great. Right. It's just like okay. I see. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's something to consider. Just being a little bit more, maybe being more specific in what we're looking for as a board, in terms of um, broadening our broadening the definition of this policy. Yeah. But that would be down the road. I think we can vote on the monitor. Well, I think because as in my eyes, the policy as it stands, I agree with Libby's policy monitoring report in terms of compliance as, as it stands, compliance with but I agree with the issues that you raise yeah, and it's a, it's a matter for you know, the policy. Yeah, that's, policy. that's on us okay. now. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's one to put on the, our list of like higher priority. We have a lot of work to do. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Um, F21 firearms? Yeah, I mean, it's another one that will need to be revised. Yeah. But I move to approve the monitoring report. Second. Second that. Uh, discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you.